last talk, so um, please please stay with me. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, I think um, software is eating software, um, but I think uh, if it's um, if it's the last talk of the day, you might as well spice up a bit and say software is eating software engineers. Um, hey, uh, I am Henry. Love humans. Love computers. Uh, have always loved human computer interaction. So how humans can interact with interact with computers. And I'm sort of wondering. How will computers interact with humans? At Henry Moulton on Twitter. Uh, as Mo mentioned, I am a principal engineer at Yonder. Three years ago, um, I was at Amazon. And these co-founders said, hey, we're starting a credit card. And uh, I was like, that's crazy. Who would start a credit card? Three years later, uh, I'm still there. And uh, we've built a, a sort of challenger to American Express uh, that you can use your points in and around London and now the UK. Um, and people really, really love it. And we've been using React Native uh, all the way through. And like Mo mentioned, but before that, I was a freelancer contractor building React Native apps. And before that, I had the, uh, the pleasure of using Angular I Ionic. Um, just a quick disclaimer, this is not uh, the opinions or work of my employer. Um, so, so, so take that with uh, everything I say with a grain of salt. And um, yeah, um, there's, there's nothing new under the sun. As they say, um, this is a this is a, an advert from 1995. Build programs without programming. See how layout lets you build real programs without without writing a single line of code for free, um, or maybe $99.95. Um, this is back when there was no app stores or even really a, a functioning internet, and you, you'd have to like buy software by calling a phone number and they, they'd, they'd mail it to you. It was a really really sort of different time. Um, uh, why that's relevant? Last year, I was up on stage at AppJS, and I was sort of looking at a new end-to-end -end testing framework. ChatGPT had sort of been dropped, and I was sort of like putting together, well, if we have really, really good end-to-end -end testing, could it be possible that AI could be running your end-to-end -end tests or figuring out what end-to-end -end tests to run? And so it sort of finished with two sort of ideas. Does writing the correct tests become the most important part of our jobs? And does the specification become the product, the, the requirements, the, the natural text? Because, you know, I heard there's a there's a flutter uh, day tomorrow. Well, you know, bad news for them. I think React Native has one. Um, and yet, uh, I had a walk with Charlie, CEO of Expo, uh, last year in, in Krakow at FJS, and he, he he said something that just really reinforced me that the, the job's not done. It just shouldn't be this hard to develop apps. And so this is a talk in three sections. Uh, firstly, how building software is changing, a little bit on agents, and then. You know, bring it back to us as software engineers, mobile engineers, jobs and specialization and consolidation in, in the job market. So let's kick it off with how, soft, how building software is changing. So I was built, born in the 90s. Built in the 90s? No, I'm not an AI. Born in the 90s. Um, <laughs> uh, great year, uh, uh, 94. Forrest Gump, uh, Lion King, Four Weddings and a Funeral, Pulp Fiction, but also, um, there's, this, uh, there's, there's this article uh, I found that said, the world's computers are talking to each other. As the web spreads, calling someone a geek may yet become a compliment. Not sure it's happened yet, two decades later, but um, uh, that's Tim Berners-Lee, so Tim Berners-Lee. And yeah, so we have the sort of arrival of the internet, um, you know, uh, or how people thought the internet would be, surfing the web. And that's what Microsoft's uh, web page looked like. That was the best-selling computer. What, uh, the best-selling computer of '94 looked like uh, the Commodore 64. That was what Windows looked like in '94. That was what mobile. Ooh. That was what mobile phones looked like in '94. And if you fast forward to the next decade, all of a sudden we get something that looks like this. Um, I love this quote from an engineer at Motorola. I worked at Motorola when the iPhone came out. Every single engineer knew this thing would blow everything else out of the water. It was one of the largest leaps in consumer tech devices ever. And it's an interesting question. You know, I won't do any hands up because it's the last talk of the day, but how many of you thought you'd end up developing for the iPhone when it came out? I was a teenager. The fact that, you know, there wasn't even an app store, the idea that I'd be end up developing software for it was was um it wasn't it didn't come across my mind at all. Um but you know, uh Google followed suit with Android and we were off uh to the races. And the mobile S curve, the, the way that mobile adoption um, uh, happened, surpassed the PCs. Mobile phones 
this this new way of computer uh, you know accessing computing was uh, over quick, quickly overtaking PCs um, and just grew and grew and grew in a nice little sort of wave curve as you can see there and you can sort of see that there's a you know, with every deployment, creation and deployment of a new technology, we have that sort of crazy idea and that frenzy, and then that de deployment phase where we're sort of scaling and it's maturing. And so you can sort of see here in 2009, we had that sh uh, massive uptake of iOS and very, very little of Android. And this is sort of the iOS Android market share in the US. And you can sort of see as, it, as it's moved out towards 50-50. Not so much the case worldwide, but, you know, pr pretty stable. Um, iOS has about 20, 20 to 30 percent market share. It is actually, if you look, if you look, it's actually slightly rising since 2018. Um, but uh, overall, you know, the, the way that the mobile sort of wave turned out to be was uh, two platforms. Which, you know, when Meta was looking at deploying their applications to to the Play Store and App Store, they just saw, well, we've just got to build something that you can build on both. Um, and um, I'm just going to use this to take a quick sip of water. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, this brought about some really, really great apps, you know, Discord and many, many others now that now today we almost take for granted are built off this. What at the time seemed an absurd idea that you could build apps using JavaScript. Um, but I guess the point is, you know, technologies come in waves. Waves have bubbles. We've seen bubbles, you know, uh, 01. Um, and more recently, you know, the, the crypto bubble. Uh, waves can come crashing down. I think we, we saw that in the last few years with tech definitely readjusting. But waves are also a powerful form of energy, and waves can be surfed. Um, how you define a wave, I think, is really, really interesting. You know, are we in a AI wave, or are we just part of something greater we can't even see? Um, there's, some, there's some really great economists who have studied this. And you know, you could call t uh, technology waves starting with um, you know in 1771 the Industrial Revolution, and then going into the age of steam, and then going into the age of steel, the age of oil, and more recently this sort of ICT revolution where we've had everything since the 70s. Um, I tried to find some way to encapsulate all that, um, and uh, but I saw uh, there's some really fantastic videos from this fir investing firm called Sequoia, who hosted an AI summit. And uh, if you zoom into one of their slides, I've, I've stolen it. So you've got you know, 60s semiconductors, 70s systems, um, networks we start seeing in the 80s. And then you know, by the 90s, we've got the internet, where you've got sort of your first early innings of websites. And then in the 2000s, we start seeing you know, web applications. And then in the 2010s, we've had mobile applications, which we're all used to using. We have been surfing um, the, the, the most recent wave of technology. But if you compress all of that internet and mobile usage that we've had over the two de last two decades with a lot of GPUs, about $100 million worth of here, you get this. Um, what was going on? So uh, three things to just sort of dive into. So cloud computing and GPUs, lots of UI and user-generated content, and then also AI research. And we're just sort of skirting over this very, very quickly. So um, cloud computing. Did we finally figure out serverless? You know, this idea that you can scale up unlimited amounts of computation. Well, there's many charts I could probably point to. You know, you could probably point to the rise of AWS, GCP, Azure, et cetera. But I found this paper from, from Meta um, called Hyperscale and Low-Cost Serverless Functions at Meta. Turns out Meta has been scaling into the trillions of calls um, their serverless, fun uh, serverless functions. Um, in the inside of their private cloud. And I think this is a testament over the last two, three years that we've really been able to figure out a really great way to distribute and scale computing, which you know is is the the backbone of what we see today in um, training training um, AI models. So diving a little bit into AI research and just trying to summarize it in just a few slides, very, very difficult, but this is my best attempt. Uh, 2015. I remember reading this blog post from Kapathy, who at the time was doing a Stanford PhD, and he s he wrote this blog post: the unreasonable, the unreasonable effectiveness of recurrent neural networks, and it starts with a very interesting first sentence. There's something magical, magical about recurrent neural networks, which reminded me of a quote: "Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic." Very telling. 
if I'd paid attention a little more to that, to this blog post, rather than maybe fiddling around with um, what I've been doing at the time, yeah, Ionic and Angular, I might have had a very, very different career. Um, a few years later, we, we have the Transforms paper, which is one of the really fundamental uh, academic papers which has shaped, um, which has shaped a, a lot of the sort of underlying architecture of um, AI models today. And then a few years later after that, we have the GPT-3 paper from OpenAI, um, which is starting to, you know, it's not quite as impressive as where we are today with, um, with um, GPT-4, but many people started looking at this and, and taking it a lot more seriously. The following year, they took GPT-3 and fine-tuned it on public code from GitHub. And that, that today powers GitHub Copilot, which, uh, if I were to guess, above 50% of the room uses today. And then a few years later, governments start getting involved. Everyone's saying the world is going to collapse and AI is going to rule the world. And Microsoft Research publishes Sparks of AGI. We demonstrate that beyond its mastery of language, the model can solve novel and difficult tasks that span mathematics, coding, vision, medicine, law, psychology, and more without needing any special prompting. But a big reason why um, ChatGPT grew, uh, grew to prominence, it was that the first time they'd taken an AI model and really given it a UI that, that people could interact with. And that's something that we've seen over the last you know, sort of decade as well. We, we, you know, I'd point to Dan's talk, Hot Re Reloading with Time Travel, um, which was the first time we really started to see that React could be used to make really interactive applications. And we're all familiar with, maybe all of us or many of us are familiar with this equation that our UI tree is really just a function of its state. And uh, if you're doing prompting, you're essentially creating the functions and you know, querying for the large amounts of intelligence um, that these models are trained on for it to be returned as some nice JSON conversation. So if you put it all together, you've got instantly scalable computation, unlimited intelligence, and declarative generatable UI. Many people are calling this software 3.0. Software 1.0 is the software we're all used to writing. Software 2.0 was you know, almost like a messy middle where we're starting to add some machine learning algorithms. Um, and software 3.0 is this idea that you can write natural language, um, converse with an agent, and it's going to create the programming readable code for you. So moving on to agents. I'll take a quick drink. So I've played games. I'm used to the bots winning. Whether it's poker or Dota, I'm used to the bots affecting the in-game economy. Um, bots today, you know, particularly if you're a gamer, you're, you're familiar. You're, you're used to the idea that um, people developing bots can affect the win condition of a game and can also affect the wider economy of, say, an, um, an MMO RPG. Um, I think many of us are getting used to the idea of bots, AI, are going to change our economy. You know, you're seeing uh, research and people publishing things like this, right? The, you know, 15 years ago, you'd have 10 engineers, one product manager, and one designer. Five years ago, that's slimlined. You know, maybe you're using React Native, and you, you have a lot more efficiency. And now it's going to be one person. It's going to be an AI PM. Um, I, I do think there's some truth in this, which is that I believe we as software engineers will be expected to leverage AI to increase the speed at which we build software. But you know, if you swapped AI there with React Native, the, the same is true. We're just, you know, rather than having lots of different types of um, specialist engineers, you can condense it into, into maybe one. Um, but I think there's where I'm sort of seeing hype and a bit too much is this idea, you know, we're getting to maybe like a thousand X productivity. Um, which I think we're maybe just a little early on, but there's there's some interesting shoots I'm going to show uh, in a second that, that that maybe there's some progress towards some number of some massive amounts of efficiency enhancement. This idea that you'd go from a 10x um, AI enhanced engineer, which many of us maybe are using today, with with Dart, we're not familiar with maybe some language, so we'll say, hey, uh, I want to, you know, I know TypeScript, let's say, and I know what I want to achieve in Objective C. Can you take this TypeScript code and translate it over? And uh, I myself have done that when, when using React Native. Um, you've also got the idea of you know, 10x AI product engineers, where you're utilizing LLM frameworks to create new workflows and new products. And then more recently, we're starting to see this idea of a 10x AI engineer agent, which is the, the idea that you are instructing uh, an autonomous agent, an autonomous bot, just like games, to, to do something for you. 
And the, the crucial, I think, distinction here is that that can scale. It's not one versus one. Um, that can scale to into the, into the thousands, millions, just like we saw with Facebook serverless um, adoption. So um, early signs, we, we sort of started, uh, started to see this. So many of you will have seen Devin, the first uh, build as the first AI software engineer agent. When I saw Devin, I was intrigued um, because they made some interesting claims. They made claims that they were the best um, AI agent on the, on the market. Um, and if you look at the, the title there, Real World Software Engineering Performance, bracket Sweebench. And uh, you know, I think there's going to be, as I'm going to dig into, there's going to be many more agents um, on the market and, and, and things like Devin, because you know, th there's potentially real productivity gains for businesses to adopt these over you know, essentially paying for software engineers. Um, but what intrigues me was more the SWE bench um, uh, benchmarks. So, so what is that? So it is a benchmark um, where a, uh, an agent is then instructed to solve GitHub issues. Um, it's a fascinating paper, how they've decided how to, to, to go about choosing which issues and what, what constitutes a good problem for a software engineering agent to solve. Um, and there's a leaderboard. Um, and uh, Devin's not part of it because they were unable to verify the results um, as, as correct. But more recently, the people behind um, uh, Sweebench have published their, their own agent using GPT-4, which resolves 12.47% res uh, of all issues. And if you notice, I think the, uh, you know, 12%, okay, that's not, gonna, that's not gonna be that useful for me today. But it, it's not so much the point uh, or the, the amount resolved, it's the progress. If you look just six months ago at the bottom there, it was 0.17%. So what I encourage us all to think about is just trying to um, not so much critique an individual point, but trying to understand what the curve is. Remember the early curves I showed you uh, with mobile? What's the curve we're seeing here? Because this is an expansive landscape. You know, there's people trying to, whose full-time jobs are to try and figure out how to in, what to invest in across all of this. Um, and it's it's difficult because so many people have their own opinion about what's useful. Um, many of them have big, bold claims. Uh, Adept is one from ex-OpenAI engineers saying that they are a new way to use computers. We're building a machine learning model that can interact with everything on your computer. And I, I do believe to some extent that this is on the way, this, this is happening. So I think a final idea here is what happens when you give GPT-10 full access to your machine? Just a... I'm just going to leave that one up there and take another sip. So how does this affect me? Um, how does this affect us? Jobs, specialization, consolidation. So, you know, last talk of the day. Let's, 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 let's scare some people. So um, here's uh, the, percent uh, the changes in engineering jobs over the last month, four months. Um, and you can see mobile engineer in the red. AI, machine learning, uh, up in the green. We are no longer the hot new thing. Um, but take heart, is what I say. Um, the main thing I think we need, to, we need to confront is the idea that just coding will no longer be enough. But maybe, actually, that's a massive opportunity for us to, to rethink about what it is to build software. Um, in design, they say that all of design goes through a, a, a process of discovering, defining, developing, and delivering. And when I look at the tools we have today across generating UI, generating design, generating code, I cannot help but feel that individually, we should be starting to think about how we might do each one of these as, a, as, a, um, as one person being able to de deliver or contribute across the full spectrum. Of, uh, of this workflow. You know, I, s I spoke with a, a designer of 20 years experience and they said, Henry, to do all that, you'd have to be a unicorn. Um, but even before AI, there's, there's, there's people who do this. They, they, they find um, gaps in the market of software that they want to go build. Um, they design it, they market it, they build it, they, um, they monetize it. Um, the indie hackers community, I think, is an early snapshot of the potential productivity uh, any one individual can have 
when um, when when it demands it. Um, I think also something I, I think about a lot is during the last decade, the MBA was ridiculed by tech. But um, as I'm about to explain, maybe actually planning, strategy, and uh, a bit of management skill is is actually going to be useful. Maybe the new MBA is master of busy agents. Um, there's a fantastic uh, blog post by Christoph Nakazawa, who is you know creator of Jest, X React Native team. Uh, it's a fantastic, fantastic blog post. I really recommend uh, reading it. But inside it, he drew a fantastic Venn diagram of the responsibilities you might have as an IC and the responsibilities you might have as an engineering manager. And you know, in the middle there, hiring, project management, mentorship, planning. I don't think that stuff's going to go away, regardless of how much um, AI you add. If we think about um, the four Ds earlier, um, I also think you know being able to see that design and product management also intersect with that is incredibly useful, because I think for us as mobile developers in particular, picking up a bit of design, picking up a little bit of commercial awareness cannot be a bad thing. So closing out on a more positive note. Um, the internet and mobile connected us all. People could work and communicate from anywhere, and many jobs were created across the world. AI does swap labor for compute. It's, it's quite obvious that this is going to be ongoing, and over the next few years, we'll, we'll see many um, AI agents attempting to replace the role of, of someone's job. And I, I do think when, um, when you've got that in the market, there will be a return of specialization and a bit more sort of freelancing contract specific work where it's it's a fixed price for the job. Um, and yes, a lower floor does enable anyone maybe to, to, to write more code or to create software. But I think there's a much higher ceiling as to what any one individual can build. And these are changing times, but I would much rather know how to leverage computers and to be able to build software in this cycle than not at all. What will we build? Who will it help? Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, so me and Henry have had conversations around this for many, many, many hours. Uh, we had a lovely lunch together talking about all of the changes that are happening in the uh, AI space uh, a few weeks ago, I think it was. Um, and so it breaks my heart to say that we're running so behind schedule that we won't be able to have a Q&A. Um, but um, you will be able to catch Henry at the after party and give him all of your AI-related questions and uh, have a chat with him. So once again, thank you so much, Henry. A round of applause. Thank you, guys.